All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome into the Homegrown Happy Hour podcast. Tonight, we are doing it Zoom style, and I got a very special guest. This is somebody that I've been wanting to have on the program for quite a while now, and we finally made it happen. Welcome on, Mr. Justin Perkins. How's it going, buddy? Very good. Thank you very much for having me. Hey, thank you for uh, coming on the program, man. Yeah, it's uh, kind of tricky these days making these podcasts happen, but we finally done it. Yes, I, I'm on the road quite a bit, and, and that makes it kind of hard. I just finished up a run from Indiana, started in Indiana and worked a little while, uh, drove through Illinois and Missouri, hit Arkansas, worked Arkansas for a while, Mississippi a little bit, and then back down to Louisiana and then back home. So I, I'm a little out of reach sometimes. Hey, it's all good, brother. Um, so what is it? Like, what line of work are you in, if you don't mind me asking? Because I see you um, post, like, all these beautiful pictures all the time, but I'm not even sure what it is that you do. Natural gas. I've been in the natural gas industry, for the most part, inspection and safety for the last eight years. But I've been in the industry for going on 17 years. Wow. But now the last two years, probably more time at home than actually work in the industry's kind of fell off a little bit. Yeah. So, so what type of natural gases are you using now? Because I, I know with the whole coal thing being shut down, I'm curious, like, what other natural elements are they using now for power? Well, really, to be completely honest with you, they'll, they haven't phased out coal. Um, honestly, it, it, it's become more expensive to run it because of the scrubbers and things required. But really, it's just where they're getting it from is a mm -hmm. little different. Like when we hit this big shortage uh, in coal jobs, uh, you know, eight years ago, a lot of that work just moved to Western Kentucky and Illinois and out west. So you're still mostly coal, even though, to my understanding, especially, and you got to understand the industry you work for is going to put out literature that's positive on their behalf, but yeah. based on natural gas information that's currently out there, it's probably a cleaner method than coal. It's definitely a more viable method as far as accessibility. We have a lot of it. Um, it just takes a lot more to produce, I guess, the amount of energy that coal produces. But we've not really changed a whole lot. Our nuclear energy has not increased really that much as a country. Our solar energy output's not increased that much by as a country. Uh, we actually have, quite, you know, you go through Indiana, you see a lot of wind turbines and things of that nature. But natural gas is is really... It's cheap. It's very cheap. I've heard some people say, and I can't attest to this because I wasn't around in the 70s, but I've heard some people say that natural gas is selling cheaper than it was when it was at its lowest in the 70s right now. And I know a lot of natural gas companies are struggling right now. So you would think, I mean, some some cities, you know, they run their uh, their transit systems or buses off of that. Some natural gas companies like EQT, they'll run some of their trucks off natural gas. Uh, you can get it in a liquid form. It, it used to equal out to about $1.25 a gallon. So there's a lot of opportunity there for gas. It's just not really being uh, really used to its full potential at this point. And, yeah. and other factors in the market hurt it. I know a lot of people kind of think that the big gas line that they just canceled would hurt. But actually, that would kind of help some of your natural gas companies. That hurts your oil companies more than anything, but that should maybe give the natural gas companies a little boost if they're able to take advantage of the market. Yeah, I, I'm way too dumb to understand any of the whole natural gas process. I don't know that much about it, but I, I'm curious with your knowledge of it, how everything is kind of transferring over to technology nowadays and people are running certain things off of solar power and stuff like that. Do you think that there might be a day where natural gas and other natural elements like that that we use for fuel with power that would they'll just be obsolete, almost non-existent. I think coal is definitely going that route um, of Do being kind of obsolete. The others as well. Uh, natural gas, I think, will probably go up in usage before it completely goes out. But I, my knowledge of my knowledge of solar is fairly limited, but I know this. China is currently one of the largest solar producing countries in the world, I believe, and they're expanding at that at a pretty exponential rate. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, mm -hmm. China does not do things because it's good for the environment. They don't do things because it's socially acceptable. They do things because it's profitable. So mm -hmm. if China is finding solar profitable, then I would have to think that there's actually some possibility that solar is a good alternative going down the road. And, and you know, the gas companies, say, especially here in Eastern Kentucky, because I worked a long time here and I worked my first seven years in Virginia, just right over the border in Clintwood and those areas. Um, you know, they have a lot of gas wells and meters and stuff. Almost all of those have a small, and it's a very small, but a small solar system. That, that's how they run those power-wise. If they're not running a gas generator, they're running solar. So th there's a good tie in there. You know, I see a lot of the wind turbines up in Indiana. They have natural gas lines running to them. I don't know what that's for. Uh, if it's a backup power source, something to get them started. But uh Alternative energies are definitely going to make their way in. Uh, it, it's just when it becomes more advantageous for a company financially and honestly politically to do those things, then, then you'll see them come through. Uh, I think you're just in that last hurrah of oil and gas and coal trying to make that big money before they go out. But coal's getting extremely expensive to get to. That's, that's the issue is it's costing more to get the coal than it's profitable. And so I, I think that's really what's hurting coal. Yeah. Uh, see, it's funny that you bring up China because last night I was uh, checking the weather on my phone just to see what it was. And I never like, really scrolled down on it. And I seen something that was like talking about the air quality. And I'm like, <laughs> uh, people are checking the air quality. And I went down the rabbit hole of learning about air quality control last night. Uh, I've got it pulled up on my phone here for the people that, no, you can't see any of that. People with an iPhone can look it up. But uh, anyways, like the AQI, I forgot what that stands for. But uh, it, if it's low, it's good. And on here, it has zero to 500. So I guess 500 is the worst. And I looked it up. I'm like, well, what happens if the air quality gets to 500? And they said it was 20 times what they recommend safe air to be. That's what 500 is. And Beijing, their air quality is 700 and something. I, I forget what it is, but it's all the way in the 700s. I mean, yeah, when, whenever, you're, whenever you're saying that they don't care about the quality that they're producing, they're just worried about profiting, that's very, that's exactly what's going on in Beijing. That yes. was a crazy little fun fact to learn last night. And you look at that city too, just smog has filled the air. I mean, it's, almost it looks like an apoc apocalypse scene it really does well that's why they've that's why they've been wearing masks for 10 years you know yeah, yeah. Uh, that they've been doing what we're having to do in the case of coronavirus they've been doing for 10 15 years and it's because of air quality it's because the particulates in their air are large enough that they can cause apparently some respiratory issues so that's a lot of the reason why they wear those masks uh but you know their regulations are not anywhere near on par with the United States. When, when, when a lot of countries talk about carbon footprint, you know, a lot of studies have shown that if the United States had no carbon footprint at all for the next 10 years, it would have little to no impact because in air quality and things like that, you've got countries like China, you've got countries that in, in certain parts uh, of Asia and in that continent, especially third world countries that are kind of making that step up to, you know, second world. And they're kind of hitting an industrial revolution like we hit, you know, a hundred years back. And they're just now hitting that. And so the amount of pollution we put out during the industrial revolution, they're equal in that now, sometimes, uh, you know, selling way past it, you know, Plastic in the ocean, you know, you hear, I've heard all these things about this Texas size island in the ocean. And, and I watched a documentary on that once that said probably somewhere in the area of 75% of that waste comes from the river in, in, in India. You know, it's one of the most polluted rivers in the world. I, I mean, the regulations in some of these other countries, it's sad because they're beautiful places. China is a beautiful place, you know, as far as the geology goes and, and uh, you know, especially the history, they're a very old civilization and they're, you know, they're kind of taking hits from all sides environmentally. At one point in time, they were storing our coal in the ocean. I don't know if that's still a practice or not, because I think even they are trying to work their way out away from the coal. 
Yeah, I, I didn't know about the ocean thing. That's that's pretty crazy right there. You know, I don't know if it preserves it. I don't know what the the idea was there, but that, you know that was talk for a long time that they were just making these large dumps of coal in the ocean. Yeah, I, I seen a well, I heard a song the other day. It's uh, by a guy named Billy Strings. It's called Watch It Fall. He says junkies hooked on fossil fuels heading for withdrawal. And man, that really stuck out to me because, you know, eventually it might not be anytime soon, but we will run out of natural resources on this planet. It's just, I mean, nothing lasts forever. The old saying. So we're, what? are you going to be one of those people that kind of takes the trip to Mars whenever that's available? Oh, I would go in a heartbeat. <laughs> <laughs> Which, look, I like to travel. I, I would go almost, I think any experience you know, at that point, you're looking at an experience that most people have never even imagined being possible outside of Elon Musk. I think he was born knowing it was possible, but it, it's, I don't know, I, a lot, <laughs> the last book, the last book I wrote, I wrote the majority of that book in 2019 and then released it in 2020, but it, it was I mean, it was made for 2020, and, and it, not intentionally, but it was. And one, one topic that just kept coming up in my head a lot while I was writing the pieces for that book is, is kind of our existence here on Earth and kind of how we, you know, if, if you looked at it from a much larger scale than we're able to look at it from, uh, if, if you saw the human race in a different way, it would be very easy to confuse us with a virus and, and, and you know, virus is spread. Yeah. And, and I think it's inevitable that we spread. And that's in no way saying that I feel that about the human race, but it, it's just an observation of what something greater than us might see us as. Mm -hmm. and, and I think it's inevitable. I, you know, I think that's, that's why exploration was such a huge part of, of our early history is there is that drive in in humankind to see new things do new things go new places and that outside of the the ocean floor that's the next you know space is that next adventure and i think it's impossible to keep us here i, I think that's one thing we will no matter what accomplish is, is interstellar travel I, I just don't think we're capable of staying in one spot and to be honest, I think it's going to be sooner than later. They're already talking in 2027, I think it is, that they're going to have this type of space hotel that can accommodate up to 400 people. And I mean, that's just the start of it right there. Within the next 50 to 100 years, it'll be back and forth travel to Mars, I'm pretty sure. I mean, technology is just progressing so fast nowadays it's impossible to wrap our minds around what will be possible next year or what's even already possible that they're just not even telling us about to begin with. Oh, no doubt. And like you said, they're, they're talking about hotels and they're talking about private industry. Once private industry was allowed to get involved with SpaceX and companies like that, there is the possibility for profit. And most of our progress throughout history has been – either driven by necessity of survival or profit. And once it becomes profitable, because at this current time, it's not a necessity to survive. So once it becomes profitable, it, it's going to be hard to stop. And, and you know, so guys like Elon Musk who can find a way to, to make it profitable and exciting – are going to lead the way in that. And, and SpaceX is making a huge difference because since the shuttle program shut down, you know, this is one of the first times since the shuttle program shut down that we are able to go to space without having to go to Russia and say, hey, you know, we need a ride basically because yeah. that was our only way to get to the space station or anything like that. Yeah, it's, it's really exciting right now what's going on because space has always fascinated me. But we've always been limited due to the government funding with NASA. But now, like you said, with private industry getting involved, it is getting exciting. Elon, buddy, I don't know where he came from. It's just like he popped out of nowhere. He's almost like an alien, to be honest. That guy's a little bit weird. But uh, 
he is it's very exciting to see what he's doing i'm really interested in what he's going to be doing here on earth as well uh have you looked into anything about the Neuralink device that he's releasing sometime this year yes and, and to be honest with you Neuralink makes me a little nervous um, yeah man it's I probably share his fear in ai i, I i'm not uh I, i'm not an idealist when it comes to, to AI, I don't know that it's a great thing. Maybe that's, you know, the next great change in, in human life is uh, some type of cybernetic unity. I don't know, but yeah, Neuralink for what he's intending it for is a great thing. You know, the possibilities for disabled people, especially veterans and, and, and people who have neurological disabilities or, you know, their physical body can't work at the same speed as their brain due to physical limitations i mean it could be one of the greatest advancements if he's ever going to get a nobel peace prize you know that that's probably where it's going to come from if, if Neuralink is successful and can do what he hypothesizes it can do then i, I mean it, it probably it'll definitely be the greatest thing ever invented in my lifetime you know yeah. what we do wrong with it from there, you know, and if he's right and we're already in a simulation, then it doesn't matter. But if he happens to be wrong, then it worries me. Yeah. Well, it's like, you know, the invention of a knife. I'm sure somebody made that to cut up meat. Then somebody stabs somebody, you know, it just takes that one person with that one bad idea to do God knows what I, I see. I'm even worried about the hacking. I mean, if we can hack these central intelligence bases, like some of these other foreign entities do, then, if you have a little chip in your brain, yeah, for like the people that don't know about the Neuralink, it's a little quarter size device that they're going to put in your skull. They actually take out a piece of your skull, put that in there, and it'll attach to certain parts of your brain. And like you were talking about with disabled people, um, from what I understood, paraplegics will be able to walk again. People with dementia will be able to remember again. I mean, really crazy stuff. And uh, I think they already worked it out on a chimp. Um, and I guess it went good because they're supposed to have the first human trial sometime this year. From That's what Elon said. I'll, I'll see. It's, it's I, cool, I mean, it's uh, we're basically already going into the cyborg age. We're, this right here, everybody, you've always got this on you. It's almost like a piece of you as is. It's a, uh, who knows, man? Future is a, uh, it's going to be interesting. Well, on, on, you know, the scale of social evolution, as far as how we evolve as a society, you know, very, very seldomly do things change because it's fun or because it's enjoyable completely. You know, anything from the way we look to, you know, the, the, the cell phone, it, it has to become a necessity of life to become that ingrained and when cell phones were just fun and it was just you know you were able to contact people and have a little more accessibility throughout the day and it was still just a cell phone but now it's almost an, an unavoidable part of your daily life because like today I, I had the conference call this morning your emails us being able to do this for everything that it lends to you on an entertainment level or even on just a convenience level, it's become very ingrained in the way that we do things. It definitely makes us more productive in a lot of ways. Um, I'm not always the biggest fan of technology. I'm not always the biggest fan of having a cell phone constantly. And, you know, to be able to do what we're doing right now is amazing. And to me, you know, I, I love the fact that that's a possibility now. There are detriments to it. There's things I look at and go, no, you know, that, that worries me. Uh, but for it to become as per pervasive as it has in our society, it's because it's become a necessity for how we make money. And, and that drives a lot. And with something like the Neuralink, I don't think it will have – as many people kind of looking at the negative connotations to it at first, because it's designed to do something that is not financially productive, but socially beneficial. And, and you know, a lot of things start out that way. Social media started out that way. I'm not a huge fan of social media. To me, it's no longer really 
socially beneficial. I mean, you still get to stay in contact and things like that, but it's become very much a big business. And I'm sure that down the road, Neuralink may do the same thing. But as far as people hacking it, I mean, they've been able to hack most of these remote driving cars except for the Tesla. So as long as Elon's in charge of it, I, you know, safety yeah. probably will be fairly. It's the knockoffs that will come with it. It's what China will develop. Uh, those are the type of things that worry me. Oh, uh, yeah, interesting. I didn't think about any uh, knockoffs coming along with it, but it would have to be. Any, any business will have competition. So that's going to be interesting to see as well. See, I think that the younger generation, though, they don't think like me and you do because we're, we kind of got caught right in the middle of the big <laughs> technological boom. Like I didn't have an iPhone until four or five years ago, something like that. Uh, didn't have a MP3 player just until a few years before that. I mean, heck, I didn't have an actual phone until I was 16, something like that. But nowadays, these kids, it's almost like they're born with it in their DNA. I've got um, my, my nephew right now. He is so far past me whenever it comes to knowledge and technology. He is eight years old and rebuilds computers, rebuilds fans. I mean, all types of really crazy stuff. And he's not going to be the only kid with that mindset. I think that they're going to look at this whole, the cyborg era, basically, as a good thing. And like you said, that's a good point. If you have people like Elon Musk who has really taken it serious and has billions of dollars to back up these efforts and make sure they're uh, fault-proof, it might actually be a good thing. Uh, you know, he, Elon has, I think, a, he everyone has ego to a certain degree. It, you know, it, it's something that, you know, I, I like to, to try to contain – any ego, you know, it's something jujitsu will teach you. He goes bad. Uh, but I think he also, a lot of people probably disagree with me on this. I think for the most part, when he does something, he has profit in mind. But I think he has real innovation in mind. I think he really wants to do something innovative and good. So it makes me more comfortable that somebody like him's doing it. But now, as for the generational thing, I think you're exactly right. I think that transitional group. Every generation wants to see the same thing in the future's generation that they saw in themselves. You know, nostalgia now is huge. Um, and I think that you want to look at your kids and you want to see the same exact experience in them that you had yourself, especially if it was a good experience. And I think that's why maybe the generation before us, you know, like I can remember for a time, you know, and it, I think it's shifting back actually, but, you know, Facebook become the the old people, you know, uh, social media. And because they were very accepting of it. The generation before us was very accepting of it. And I think it's because they were somewhat removed from seeing the next generation go into that trend. And then the generation after it, you know, I, I've got kind of both ends of that spectrum. I've got uh, a 22-year-old daughter and I've got a 10-year-old kid, a son. And, you know, their, my daughter is nowhere near as immersed as my son is. She is in the social aspect of it, but not maybe the entertainment and uh, the information aspect of it that my son is. But I struggle with that a lot. My son is Ashburgers and, and sensory processing, and we were, it was highly recommended to us to use that iPad as somewhat of a, I guess, a, a, a helping hand in getting him um, used to certain things. And, and, you know, there were games and everything. It's become such a part of his life. But I look at the amount of knowledge he's got and the way he's able to access and obtain it. And I guess I kind of look at it different. So it's harder in that intermediaries. Uh, again, the, the, the last book I wrote, there, there's a part in one of the poems um, – and that's sad that I can't remember what I wrote myself, but something to the effect of, of no one really likes being that bridge from the past to the future. You either want to be the past, like the generation before you, or you want to be the future. Being that intermediary generation, that generation that is witness to that leap is not always fun. And, and you know, it makes it a little harder. Uh, but I, I've come to terms with it and, and, I was very anti-technology for a long time, but I've, I've come to terms with it to where I've definitely embraced it. 
to a large degree. It allows me to stay in contact with a lot of people. You know, I'm able to FaceTime my family every night when I'm on the road. That's something in the 90s my parents could not have done if they'd have been on the road. You know, to get to see somebody's face means a lot sometimes. And then, you know, from the way I do my podcast to, to being able to do this, that's all done through one device. I, I'm able to pack one device instead of 10 when I go out of town. And, mm-hmm. you know, that's a big advantage. And it's just going to keep advancing like that as well. I mean, the cell phone will, oh, an old Cat Williams joke is that the cell phone will be, just be the chip on somebody's tongue. And he said that joke uh, back in the early 2000s. And now that is a real possibility here in 2021. That's why I, I was saying earlier, it's impossible for us to predict the future because how fast we are advancing, it's almost scary. I mean, the whole Neuralink thing, I wouldn't have thought that that was possible two years ago. If you would have told me something like that, I would have said, that ain't going to be available for another 50 years or something like that. That's way out there technology. But no, here we are in 2021 and talking about putting chips in people's brains to where you can almost telepathically communicate with each other. Uh, If I understood what Elon was talking about, right, then that's one of the possibilities is like, you can listen to music in your head without having earbuds or anything, just out there stuff. And imagine in the next 10 years, what they're going to have 10 years ago was just 2011. We oh yeah. Yeah. You know, the, the iPhone was still a, a, the size of a brick basically. And here we are. It's that thin. Yeah. It's crazy. But it, it's a paper. We definitely, I mean, if you look at, I believe some out there stuff sometimes, you know, and, and maybe not, uh, maybe not believe it as much as think it's possible, but you look at, the growth we've had as a civilization globally uh, in the last hundred years, you know, or the last 200 years in comparison to, I think, uh, Gobekli Tepe is now the oldest possible civilization we're looking at. That's somewhere around some probably connected to the Sumerian civilization. And we're looking at 10,000 years, you know, so to what we've done in 200 in compared comparison to 10,000, I mean, then you look at what we've done in the last 20 in comparison to that 200, and the rate of growth is ridiculous. Like, I mean, it really doesn't hardly seem possible, you know. Um, What what you're saying is you think it's aliens. Well, you know, (laughs) you don't talk aliens. I don't talk aliens. I, I don't particularly believe that we've been visited. Uh in that respect, but I'll say this, if, if we look at the description, the, what is basically the most common description, uh, gray skin, uh, genderless, um, telepathic speaking, um, not really physically fit. A different, we look at that and you look at kind of, where maybe we're going as a society, where we're going to something like Neuralink to where it is less of a physically interactive communication and more of an electronic or even a mental communication. Uh, You go to the gender fluidity questions that are going around right now. Um, You go to the change in our physical makeup due to artificial lighting and lack of exposure to elements if anything, aliens are us from the future, (laughs) you know, and and I, I wrote a short story about that years back and, and it, it, it was very intriguing to me. And then I heard, I believe it was Rogan and um, either Rogan and Red Band or Rogan and Elon talking something very similar to that, not too long back. And, you know, that's a high probability. Yeah. See, I mean, if you were to say something like that 20 years ago, people would look at you like a crazy person. But nowadays, if people have enough knowledge of technology and our past and where the future might be going, that is a real actual possibility. I mean, time travel, that's not just something out of sci-fi movies. That is something that the government actually works on and has been working on for quite a while. So, Who's to say that us 300 years from now 
haven't figured it out and maybe came back to uh, help a little bit. I mean, it used to be, I, I used to be so narrow minded in my thinking. And just nowadays, especially with Google, the more that I learn, the more that I just think that anything is possible. I don't put anything out of the realm of possibility nowadays. I, I, I agree a hundred percent. You but, know, well, I try to make sense of it though. This is, this is one thought that I have because I'd love to think that we are time traveling visitors from our future or something like that. But also, and, th and this is just me trying to make sense of it. And even then I still find holes in this theory. The whole tell the whole invention of the telephone and the internet that would progress society quite a bit. And I know that the internet hasn't been a thing for that long, but also who's to say like how long the government has been using it because certain device, certain technologies won't be released to the public for however many years and the internet would definitely be one of those technologies and especially the phone and just being able to share information and traveling, even like all the whole voyages during the 1600s and 1700s, people visiting different countries, sharing information, yada, yada, yada. But even then that is one hell of a jump, man, to be, <laughs> when did we invent the car? It wasn't like the, I know it was the early 1900s. And then in less than 50 years, we have a man on the moon. Yeah. I mean, that's what I'm saying. That, that amount of progression we hit is unusual. Like yeah. it's in, in, if we look at, and, and it's dependent on what timeline you agree with. If, if we look and say, okay, uh, go back to Tepe 10,000 years ago, that's, we probably had a little bit of, civilization before that right around hunger dries and and we had the mail offs and, and we lost that history if we're just that old if we look at ten thousand years outside of some of the architecture you know the statues on easter island the pyramids and the accuracy in there but outside of that technologically not super we're not advancing at a massive pace and then all of a sudden whatever sparks the industrial revolution completely changes again in 150, 200 years, what we couldn't do in 10,000. I personally, it seems highly unlikely to me that 10,000 years old is as old as we are. If you do look at Sumerian texts, you look at how liberal Sumerian society was compared to other societies. And you look at, Sumerian text it's kind of hard to imagine that they sprang from nothing there had to be a little something before them uh who's to say there wasn't you know a, a civilization as advanced as we are a million years ago I mean yeah. we're in we're in a shooting gallery in, in space we easily anything could have taken them out anything could have taken us out so maybe we're just catching where we should be and maybe that's why we've been able to advance as quickly as we have see i, I love that theory right there because that's one that i like to think about a lot and to me it actually makes sense that we well our species on this planet may be far older than what they're saying i even seen something where uh they think that they uh carbon dated the uh, the, sphinx, the, the Sphinx, however you say it, they're in uh, Egypt. They think that it may be four to 8,000 years older than what they previously thought because of some, something to do with rains there in Egypt with the water erosion. Again, I'm too dumb to understand a lot of that stuff, but it was an the interesting issue. thought. And, 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 but it also would like kind of uh, help with the theory that me and you were kind of talking about as to uh, we're, sti we're still a very naive civilization who's to say that we're dating this stuff right uh, there was one a bone that was found in the san francisco area during the digging of a highway system and they found that the bone had been broken into to get the bone marrow out of it mm -hmm. and that one was stuck in the ground and the only species that would have been able to do something like that and this is again like i think it's like 150,000 years ago they're thinking something crazy is humans so if if that were to be true that would that would wipe out 
all theories. But uh, natural disasters occur on this planet so ever, ever so many years. The next one's probably going to be Yellowstone. But I mean, to our knowledge, we ha we've documented quite a few. And to some, like, the, uh, like Pompeii is a great example, sent the world into an ice age for a few years. If Yellowstone was to blow up, they think that last time Yellowstone blew up, that they found soil samples from Utah and Tennessee. That's how bad the explosion was. So, I mean, if something like that were to happen, basically everything start from scratch, there only be a few thousand people left on the earth. It is going to take a few thousand years for us to get back to where we are today. I mean, there, there's only a handful of smart people here on earth. If everything were to stop, I don't know how to make this microphone. I don't know how to make this computer. I don't know how to make this cell phone. And 99.99% .99 of people don't. We're stupid. We rely on all the smart people to help us evolve. And there's going to be a lot of evolution before we get back to where we are. But yeah, I'd love to think that we were farther advanced, that, that we were advanced back in the day as we are now, because some of these ancient structures can't be explained. It ain't uh, Gebekli Tepe, it's another one that uh, the rocks have been cut with precision so good, it's almost like they stack like Tetris blocks. And, yes. it's, and, and they're so perfect that you can't even get a sheet of paper in between these rocks. It would be hard for us to do that today with all the tools that we have. It would be so damn difficult. Even, I mean, the pyramids and Sphinx, that's another great example right there, but there's even crazier stuff than that out there. So, I mean, it's just, and also, the only thing that will last, that will stand the test of time, is rock, something like solid rock. This technology, all these wires, these lights, this building made of wood, it's going to erode over time, especially in the event of a global catastrophe. The only thing that will stand the test of time if it's not destroyed is stone. So I think that's why you have a lot of these ancient structures like Gaboko Tepe and others like that, but you don't find anything else because of course it isn't going to be around. It's, I, I love that theory because I know it would rewrite all the history books, but the more that we find out about history and we progress and we just gain knowledge, the more likely something like that's possible. Well, you've got to be open to change in history. And, and they're not to a large degree. The, the big issue with dating Egyptian culture and, and, and especially one is uh, archaeological record in regards to literature and documentation. And the other, like you said, their stone is dating. It, you, you'll have to date something you find around the stone because you can't exactly date the stone. You can date how the stone is, but not when the stone was shaped and formed and placed. So for years with, say, the Sphinx, they've dated structures found around the Sphinx, and then they've used who they, whose face they think is on the Sphinx, even though we know that's a replacement for what was originally there. And they've kind of used that to try to put it into a certain dynasty. Now, Randall Carlson is the gentleman you're talking about. He came in and through erosion, kind of looked at the erosion layers on the Sphinx and said, okay, this had to be here during a period of, of high rains, a lot of water. And when you go back and look at what point that area was actually not a desert, and, and had those types of, of rains and had them on a regular enough basis to impact the erosion of the Sphinx. Because you got to look, it was covered completely up until maybe the 1800s. Uh, it had been uncovered once before that, but for a very brief moment. Uh, they find it in the 1800s, uncover the head. The sand originally covers it back up. And it's 1900s before they completely get it dug out and look at it again. So it's been really protected from the elements. So the fact that there's this water erosion, that kind of dates it back to a certain date. But a lot of Egyptologists want to fall back to this written record. And there's a new flaw found with that written record. 
the ideal, the only way to give yourself a starting point on dating that written record is the most, really, one of the, the, the easiest articles uh, of literature to date by is, is the Bible. And so if they take certain things from the Bible, like Exodus and certain dates and certain uh, Pharaoh's names, then they can kind of build an ideal of a, a time frame around that. The problem is when Egyptologists got a hold of that, they went, okay, well, if this dynasty was happening here and, and we're in agreement biblically that it's this time period, well, biblically they stopped dating from then and Egyptologists start dating. And a lot of what they do is go, well, obviously these two pharaohs and, and couldn't exist at the same time or this. And, and so we get this timeline of, uh, of different rulers throughout Egypt all thought to be consecutive one after the other. And it's also thought that dynasties ruled independently of each other. Well, what they've found since then, and, and you know, it's happened in all other parts of the world. I don't know why it wouldn't happen in Egypt, but that these dynasties more than likely overlap. You had dynasties that ruled the North and the South, dynasties that were at war with each other. So more than likely, we don't live in 2021 because that's kind of what we based our calendar on. It's predating. We're actually probably, if if all these current experts are right, we're probably closer to 17-something instead of 2021, just based on the fact that they've given each one of these dynasties their own period. And that's made it hard to date a lot of the things in Egypt. And even though it's apparent now, completely apparent that Egyptologists were wrong, they're probably the least accepting of change of all the scientific community. Yeah. Historians, man, that is one thing that has always aggravated me about a lot of them. I'm not saying all of them are that way, but you have a lot of them that will come up with these theories. A lot of people agree on it. A few years goes by, something disproves it, and they don't want to accept it. And it's the old saying, as it goes, you know, the winner writes the history books. And it's just so He who owns the future controls – see, he – he who controls the present controls the past, and and he who controls the past controls the future. Oh, I like that. Rage against and, the machine. And, and also, uh, well, that man, I, I was almost going to go see them last year, and then and they uh, they canceled the whole tour. Them and Ronnie still the got team. tickets. I I, I actually they, uh, they I, bumped I, it. To, they bumped it to this year. I've got I, tickets I, for I, them this year. Wait, where are you going? North Carolina. Damn, I'm going to since I think Cincinnati, somewhere in Ohio, one of the shows. But uh, it is the saying though is true, and also, uh, it happens nowadays. So of course it's happened in the past. We've had records of it, but of a uh, certain, just certain history being destroyed. I mean, certain books of the Bible aren't included in it. Other ancient uh, texts as well. Uh, cities have just been burned to the ground, statues destroyed. So, I mean, our whole history is a big old guessing game at this point. But that's why I love diving down that rabbit hole, because it's endless. It's kind of like space. You, you, you're, you're never going to have all the answers. And I love just letting my mind roam with it. It's fascinating. Yeah. But it's, well, Go ahead. Oh, no, you go ahead. It, it's one of those things that there's always something that, you know, my wife, when we first, we've been together like almost 20 years. And when we first got together, you know, she'd ask me something and we'd have a long discussion about something. And then a week later she'd ask me and I'd have a different opinion. She'll go, but last week you thought this. And I'm like, yeah, but if you don't change, if you don't grow, if you don't evolve, if you don't take in new information and kind of process it and at least give it the consideration, then nothing's ever really right. You know, you're just settling for an accepted view on things. There's things I still feel the same about that I felt 20 years ago. And there's things that my mind has changed 20 times in that time. I'm not married to any belief structure at all on most of that stuff because we just simply don't know enough. So the, I get excited when there's something new. I get excited when that something new completely and totally challenges what I believe. And then I have to look at it and go, well, now hold on. What if, what if I'm wrong? Exactly. And a lot of other people need to ask that question. What if I'm wrong? Because man, we're, we're a very naive 
human race. But it's, oh, yeah. uh, it's, it's, it's good to be reminded that there's still people like you out there. Whenever I go to Walmart, it kind of, uh, my, my, my hope drops a little bit in the human race, but this builds it back up a little bit. But unfortunately, <laughs> though, man, we're going to have to uh, wrap it up. But for people that want to check out the Talk Junkie podcast and all the books that you've written, where do they go to find all that? Uh, if you want to find the podcast, it's everywhere you can get a podcast. Spotify would be my recommendation, though, because sometimes I'll do some that have music and clips and song clips and stuff in it or completely music-based. Um, you'll get that on Spotify. You won't get it on Apple. Uh, I've not done one in a while. been on the road for a long time, so it's time to get back in. I'm hoping uh, some guys you probably need to talk to, Salem's Crown, their local band here out in Knott County. Uh, I'm going to try to get them on. We'd had that planned. It didn't happen. Uh, but the books, uh, I have – Two poetry books out, uh, Co Kingdom and Creating the Perfect Slaves. Uh, then I have two children's books I wrote with my son. Everyone's different, just like me and the boy of Super Hearing. Uh, all of those are available on Amazon, but I would far prefer you go to the Red Spotted Newt in Hazard, Kentucky. Uh, it's a great store. I'm biased. My best friend runs it, but she's done an amazing job, and it really is a great store. And I, you know, she, I give them to her or sell them to her cheaper than Amazon. So it is available on Prime with free shipping, but you will give less if you go to Red Spot and New and you're supporting a local business. Um, you know, and oh yeah, shout out to Dustin Hoover. Uh, I just want to say again, thanks, dude. This has been fun. And next time we'll get you in here and we'll go a little bit longer and dive a little bit deeper down the rabbit hole, man. This was a lot of fun. Any time, man. I really, really appreciate you having me on. Ladies and gentlemen, Justin Perkins.